I can already feel the stampede of people ready to tell me off for my ignorance. But fortunately, I can't help myself. I have to speak up because everyone that believes calories are not created equal is wrong, including Dr. Fung, Dr. Barry, and many other professionals. For a long time, it has struck me how many people believe calories don't matter for a variety of reasons. And one of those main reasons is because calories are not equal. Meaning if you were to take 100 calories of broccoli and compare it to 100 calories of donuts, they wouldn't be the same. But that's incorrect. They are the same. So to create the anti-equal calorie argument, let's hear Dr. Fung on the matter and then I'll chime in and rebuff his points. One of the top comments that would keep coming up was, did this doctor really just say that the calories in calorie out model does not govern whether someone loses weight or gains weight? And so we're talking offline how there's really no receptors for calories in the body. That's yeah, and this is the thing that's very strange. So you take a concept from physics. So what calories is, is that they take a piece of steak or whatever, and they basically burn it and see how much energy it is. So you can determine how many calories are in a steak and a piece of broccoli or a piece of wood for that matter. So you just burn it and see how much physical energy there is. So the body has no receptors. It doesn't measure calories. It has no idea how many calories you eat. So if you eat a piece of wood, it might have 10,000 calories. But you're not going to absorb any of it because it goes right through you. If you eat steak, uh, if you, it's it's going to have a certain number of calories. If you eat, if you drink cola, it's going to have a certain number of calories. If you drink diet cola, it's going to have zero calories. But the body doesn't actually know that because it has no way of measuring it. So it has no way of responding to it. So why would we think that this is a sort of an important concept? And the only reason we think that is because we it's sort of been ingrained into us. But it's an it's it's a concept of physics and it's not a physiologic concept. If you put 100 calories of sugar in your mouth versus 100 calories of olive oil, the physiologic response is completely and utterly different. So you put that oil into your mouth and drink it down, for example, and there's no insulin response, for example. You eat a brownie, which is the same number of calories, and insulin spikes way up. So the body responds to hormones. I mean, everything runs on hormones, thyroid hormone, insulin, all these different hormones, and that's how it knows what to do. So when it senses that you're taking in carbohydrates, for example, then insulin will go up. If it senses that protein is coming in, insulin will go up as well, as well as something like mTOR. So there's different receptors for amino acids. There's different re receptors for fat. There's different receptors. So if you eat fat, for example, you'll have cholecystokinin release. If you eat a lot of fibrous foods, you'll have stretch receptors in your stomach, which are activated. So there are all these different things that the body does respond to, but calories is not one of them. So a few things here. Dr. Fung claims three major points. First, that the body has no receptors for calories, only for nutrients like amino acids. Second, the concept of calories is one of physics, not physiology. Third, olive oil and sugar at 100 calories each stimulate different hormones. So let's examine each one of these. First, the body has no receptors for calories. He's absolutely right. The body truly has no receptors for calories. And to his point, there are receptors for nutrients like glucose and amino acids. I'll return to this point soon. His second point was that calories are a physics concept, not a physiological concept. He's right here too. Calories originated in physics and was ported over to physiology. Okay, I'll return to this one, too. His final point is that olive oil and sugar generate different hormonal reactions within the body. Man, he's three for three. He's absolutely right again. Well then, Nick, why are we here? Why'd you waste my time clicking on this video if you're just going to agree with him? Because... Each one of those statements can be true, yet in totality, they create a false sense of knowledge because they leave out key pieces of information that are critical for an accurate understanding of calories and nutrients. We'll return to those in just a little while. I'm not here to redefine calories or to espouse some conspiracy that no one knows about calories, but rather it's vital for you to understand how to bridge the gap between calories and the nutrients that you consume. They are closely intertwined and grossly misrepresented by the calories aren't equal crowd. So yes, 
A calorie is still merely a unit of energy. It's a measure of heat. But to make false equivalencies like Dr. Barry here leads to an improper education. Okay, now there's this thing in your, in your bathroom, probably on the floor, and it looks like this. Now, what does this thing measure? Does it measure energy or does it measure mass? Right? So in order for something to show up on the bathroom scale, it has to have mass. Now, energy does not have any mass that we currently know about. Okay, so how do calories relate to fat gain, fat loss, that you might experience on the scale? The food that you consume is made of nutrients, which are molecules with a specific chemical structure. You've heard them before, carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids, or nutrient fat. But for our discussion, I'm going to use the word lipid to not confuse with our fat cells. So you consume a food, it ends up in your digestive system and is eventually broken down into those constituent nutrients, the simplest form of carbohydrate, the simplest form of protein, and the simplest form of lipid. They get absorbed by your intestinal system and are now found in your circulatory system, your bloodstream and your lymphatic system. These molecules are now coursing through your circulation until they get snatched up by your various tissues, like muscle, kidneys, liver, fat, and so on. So at this point, we still haven't mentioned calories because to Dr. Barry's point, we're discussing mass, the literal nutrient molecules themselves. We'll get to the calories though. Now, those nutrient molecules are found inside your cells that make up each of your tissues. There, they can undergo metabolism. So let's take a carbohydrate, which in its simplest form, is called a monosaccharide, or you might know it as glucose, blood sugar. Glucose has entered your cell and interacts with an enzyme called hexokinase in most of your cells. This first interaction changes the molecular structure of glucose and begins its journey down metabolism, known as glycolysis. Its molecular structure is changed over and over again until it barely resembles the glucose molecule that you consumed in your food. That molecule, now known as pyruvate, enters your mitochondria. Yes, the powerhouse of the cell. And there it's further converted into many other molecules by breaking and twisting and reshaping the molecular structure until it is turned into a new molecule called NADH. Still no calories, right? Nope. No mention of calories, but we're about to get there. This is still just the manipulation of mass from one form to another. NADH then interacts with proteins in the mitochondria, known as the electron transport chain. And those proteins, through a series of reactions, produce our final molecule of interest, adenosine triphosphate, ATP. So what's so special about ATP? Well, it's the energy currency of the cell. Whoa, hold on. We just used the word energy. Are we close to calories? We are. If we look at the structure of ATP, it is a molecule of adenosine attached to three phosphate molecules. But it's the attachment points between the phosphates and the adenosine that are of the greatest interest, because it's here that we bridge the gap between mass and energy. The bonds that keep phosphate molecules bound to adenosine are called high energy bonds. So if you break the bond releasing one or more phosphates, you unleash energy that was trapped. That energy can be detected as heat. So scientists measure the amount of heat your body produces as a measure of these bonds being broken millions upon millions of times per second. And that measure is calories. It's a proxy measure of the energy utilization of your cell. And if you multiply that out billions of times of your entire body of cells, ultimately ATP is the bridge between mass and energy, so to speak. However, not all nutrients are sent down the metabolic pathway to create ATP at the end. Some nutrient molecules are stored or used for other functions. That's where the dreaded energy balance equation comes in. We use the energy balance equation as a proxy for the balance of mass. Stated differently, we use calories because they relate to the nutrient molecules. 
aka mass, as explained before. And we are consuming more calories than our body burns, aka ATP reactions. Then we are consuming more mass than our body needs to convert into energy. So what does it do with that mass? It stores it in a variety of places, but you're probably most familiar with body fat. So let's say you need 2000 calories worth of energy to maintain your bodily functions. That translates to your cells requiring that amount of ATP to generate proteins, to allow ATP dependent enzyme reactions to occur, to move things within and between the cells and many other functions that allow the cell to survive. If you are not consuming the nutrient molecules to feed your cells so that they can generate the ATP like we described before, your fat cells, as one example, release stored nutrient molecules, in this case lipids, into circulation to feed the downstream cells and allow them the ability to generate the necessary ATP. Of course, we don't say, I need to eat 1500 calories worth of nutrient molecules to lose body fat. We say, I need to cut my calories by 500, or I need to eat 1500 calories. And that deficit in energy capable nutrient molecules leads your body to rely on the stored levels to make up the difference and bump you back up to 2000 calories expended. However, taking the mass out of your body fat to feed your other cells like muscle, liver, etc., to turn that mass into energy capable ATP leads your body fat to shrink. This is how the energy balance equation relates to food, body fat, mass, what have you. Now, hold on. I realize things aren't that simple in the real world of hunger, stress, hormones, and much more. But I'm only trying to provide the physiological link between your fat loss and gain and this supposedly purely physics principle. I hope that now you understand they're closely intertwined, and while fat loss is a literal loss of mass, the energy way of understanding it is an excellent way to describe the process, although you'd also be right by calling it the mass balance equation if you prefer. Okay, so now we should have an understanding of how nutrient molecules are related to energy, heat. But as I briefly put the brakes on, it's also true that different foods affect us differently. Let's take that on a basic level, the comparison of lipids, remember that's dietary fat, and carbohydrates. The literal molecular structure of lipids is extremely different from carbohydrates, like glucose. So, it stands to reason that they'd have different effects in the body, and this also bears out the research. For example, glucose stimulates insulin, and lipids have much less of an effect. That's one of a myriad examples without even getting into the types of lipids, the types of carbohydrates, genetics, and many other facets that complicate the physiology of our lives. I am absolutely not saying calories are the only consideration when it comes to body fat loss. But what I am saying is that calories are foundational to fat loss and must be taken into account one way or another. Yet, that gives us a background on calories, but it doesn't address Dr. Fung's criticisms. So, why did I agree with his points, yet still disagree due to the incompleteness? His first point, as a reminder, is that we don't have receptors for calories. That's, again, true. However, we have many receptors for ATP, like those found on the master molecules like mTOR, AMPK, and others. So our cells can sense their energetic state by sensing the amount of ATP present. If not through calories, then by the molecular creator of calories, ATP. His second criticism was that calories are a physics concept, not a physiological one. Again, true to a degree, but as we just went over, they're tightly locked together and cannot be separated even if physiology is also inundated with many, many other variables. His third critique is that olive oil and sugar cause different hormonal reactions. Again, absolutely true, as I explained earlier. The hormonal response is different due to the molecular structure, among other reasons like genetics, pathology, and more. None of these are arguments that calories are not equal. Why? 
because calories, as we described earlier, are a measure of the heat produced by the ATP reactions. And regardless of starting molecule used to generate that ATP, be it an unsaturated lipid from the olive oil or a glucose molecule from the sugar, in calorie equated scenarios, they both end up as the same end product, ATP, and the same amount of that end product. The ATP garnered from the sugar is the same ATP created from the lipids, just through different metabolic pathways, glycolysis for sugar and beta oxidation for lipids. But when you use that ATP and break the phosphate off, the energy release is indistinguishable, and therefore all calories are created equal because the measured heat is the same. However, I am not saying that nutrients are equal. The nutrients are very different. Normalized, calorie same, nutrients different. I realize one of the critiques coming my way is that this is all semantics, but I cannot express to you how much I vehemently disagree. If no one was going to make that argument that I'm disagreeing with myself, but I have received that feedback before, so I'll assume that it would be levied here as well. If we are not crystal clear about the foundational elements of physiology and nutrition, then we are stacking knowledge on foundations of information that are weak and cracked, and we open the doorways to thought processes that should have stayed closed. This sends us astray in a veritable ocean of information that we have yet to learn. How can we move forward to understand greater complexity in nutrition if everyone is fragmented on the definitions of our very foundations? I would argue that we can't, and that's one of the reasons that we see so much disagreement. The sooner that we lock down our base understanding from the macro to the micro, being able to trace our thoughts in and out of our cells to the full body, we will be able to passionately discuss more complex nutrition topics while speaking the same foundational language. Finally, I'd like to add that I've hit the major points, but there are significant amounts that I've purposely left out. Yet none of those omissions, like the fact that glycolysis also generates ATP independent of mitochondria, or that there are different caloric expenditures to break down different foods in the intestines, make any difference on the concepts explained. There are only layers of complexity that are unnecessary to the calorie discussion, but worthy of separate conversations without confusing this discussion. If you made it to this point, then I thank you for your patience, and I hope that you learned something. I appreciate that you ended up watching it through, and I'd certainly recommend some of my other content if you're so inclined to learn more. Until the next one. Bye. Thank you.